All right, Shalom, I'm back. And now uh, we're going to go into the book of Genesis, chapter 49 and 19. And it says, it says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but he shall overcome at the last. So what was that troop that overcame Gad? That was the United States Cavalry. And then uh, Canada was the uh, Royal Mounted Police. All right, which was originally called the Northwest Mounted Police. You know, it says at the last... These niggas talking about Gad didn't overcome the white man. None of the tribes overcame the white man, you dumbass. And it tells you at the last, talking about the last days, right, there's going to come a time when the Most High has 12,000 Gadites, along with 12,000 other 11 tribes, and they're going to overcome Esau. But that's not the time right now. How the hell can you overcome Esau right now? Tell me one African tribe that overcame Esau. Tell, them, to tell me, you know what I'm saying, because he's talking about oh, the, Gad is some African tribe, man. Show me one African tribe that overcame Esau, man. All right? And you know what? All, all of them have to get their... Guess what? All of them are, are susceptible to chemtrails from Esau, dirty water from Esau, dirty food. All right? All of them have to get their gas from Esau one way or another because it tells you that uh, the, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. All right? And we're going to show you how Gad was overcome. All right? This is called... The Oxford History of the American People by Samuel Elliot Morrison. All right, and uh, let's go to page seven hundred and fifty. Right, there's quite a few to read here, so I'm just gonna skim right through it. All right, it says uh, <clears throat> Indian, Indians, cattle, and cowboys. All right, so it says the dismal story of relation between white Americans and the American Indian continued with little change in contrast to the negroes who were denied their ambition to participate on equal terms in american civilization the indians who desired above all to continue their own way of life were deprived of hunting grounds which would have made that possible and were pressured to settle down and become good farmers and citizens before that pressure could be exerted the redskins had to be defeated in battle now they call them redskins the reason they call them redskins was because they skinned them all right, and their skin would be red because of the blood. You know, there's stories, that whole shit about scalping, the white man started that. They needed to scalp them to prove that they killed them and they get money for it. They get money for the scalps. So what did Gad do? They retaliated. They, 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 they did revenge. You know? All right. So it says, um, yeah, that's why they call them red skin, basically. That's why, you know, they, uh, they skin them. All right, uh, they used uh, their skin for horse saddles. You know, when you go into the research, man, these crackers are foul, man. That's why they call them redskin. It's not because their their skin is red, idiots. It says, uh, Indians of the Great Plains and Rocky Mountains, about two hundred twenty-five thousand in number, presented a formidable obstacle to white settlement. The strongest and most warlike were the Sioux, Blackfoot, Crow, Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Nez Pez. In the north, the Comanche, Apache, Ute, Kiowa, Southern Cheyenne, and Southern Arapaho in the south and center, mounted on swift horses, well armed for plains warfare, and living on the herds of buffalo that roamed the open range, these tribes long remained a stubborn resistance to white penetration of their hunting grounds. Now, that's not no stubborn resistance, man. If anyone's coming into your shit, you're gonna defend it. Are right, you fucking pieces of shit? That's like saying, Iran comes into your country starts taking over and then you have a stubborn resistance no you're gonna defend it but you devils you're going down anyway man you crackers you white people you caucasians you're gonna be slaves under the israelites all right the first serious invasion of these hunting grounds came with the great migration in the 1840s in 1850 there were there were approximately a hundred thousand indians in california in 1860 there were barely 35,000 despoiled by irresistible forces of the land of their fathers with no country on earth to which they can migrate in the midst of a people with whom they cannot assimilate as congress's committee on indian affairs reported the advance of miners into the mountains the building of transcontinental railroads and invasion of the grasslands by cattlemen threaten every other indian nation of the west with the same fate wanton destruction of the buffalo indispensable not only for food but for housing bowstrings lariats and fuel the cold six-shooter, fearfully efficient in the hands of pale faces, 
showing you that you crackers you ain't pale because in Isaiah 29 it tells you that Jacob's fish shall not wax pale all right the cold six shooter which is your weapon this is your blessing the cold six shooter one of your blessings the sword you shall live by it that's how you conquer the earth all right the cold six shooter fearfully efficient in the hand of pale faces and the spread of white men's diseases among the Indians all were lethal. Until 1861, the Indians of the Great Plains had been relatively peaceful, but in that year, the invasion of Colorado by thousands of miners and advance of white settlers along the upper Mississippi and Missouri began a series of armed clashes. Sioux of the Dakotas went on the warpath in 1862, devastated the Minnesota frontier, and massacred or captured almost 1,000 white people. Uh, retribution was swift and terrible, but for the next 25 years, Indian warfare was a constant of Western history. Each new influx of settlers and of railroad gangs who carelessly destroyed the buffalo drove the Redskins to raid settlements in search of food and to acts of desperation, which brought on punitive expeditions by the United States Army. There were some 200 pitched battles between soldiers and Indians in the years 1869 to 76. The contest was not unequal, for the Indians had become excellent shots. They could attack or flee from the heavy United States cavalry at will, and they were not troubled by logistic problems. Had they been able to unite, they might have tired out the United States, as white resistance to reconstruction was doing in the South, but no Tecumseh, no prophet appeared. The army could always recruit Indian scouts, and the Redskins were defeated piecemeal. <coughs> the Gadites were a war tribe. There's three war tribes, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. All right, because these were the three war tribes of, of Israel. You know, so it tells you, yeah, they, they, they could have won, but they weren't united. But that's all prophecy, because we were supposed to go down for our wickedness. You're not supposed to, we weren't supposed to unite, man. And that's Jake, man. That that, that shows you that's Jake. They, they, they don't get along. You know, all these nations are along, man. They, the gooks come in. They, they got their own shops, they're with family, you know, they got family shit going on, the, the uh, East Indians come in, you know, they got the taxi companies up here, pizza stores, the, they, they all united with family. The Kushites especially here, man, the Hamlets come up here, they got a string of convenience stores and dollar stores, they, they're all united with family, man. Only these people, the Negroes, the Latinos, the Native Americans, you're not united, you hate each other, man. You hate each other in, in, in your own in your own tribes, man. Within the tribe, you hate each other, man. You know. Uh, down here, it says General Francis A. Walker, future president of MIT, whom Grant appointed commissioner of Indian Affairs that year, did the best to carry out a paternalistic policy. He placed defeated tribes on new reservations, set up schools for their children, and issued rations to those who had no more game. But his best was not good enough. In his report of 1872. He remarked congently, every year's advance of our frontier takes in the territory as long as some of the kingdoms of Europe. We are richer by hundreds of millions, the Indian is poor by a large part of the little that he has. This growth is bringing imperial greatness to the nation. To the Indian it brings wretchedness, destitution, and beggary. For ten years after the Civil War, the Sioux in particular fought desperately to preserve their hunting grounds on the Great Plains. In December 1866, Captain William J. Fetterman, USA, stationed at Fort Phil Kearney, Wyoming, was ambushed by Red Cloud and his command of 80 men were killed. Fort Buford on the Missouri just across the Montana line was sniped at by Sioux in 1867. The American public was stirred up by a report of a horrible massacre there, there which actually never took place, a report which the Commissioner of Indian Affairs attributed to the rapacity and rascality of frontier settlers whose interests are to bring on a war and supply our armies. For several years, there were occasional skirmishes with the Sioux, but their knell of doom struck in 1875 when prospectors discovered gold in the Black Hills, them, them Thar Hills of South Dakota, and founded a fabulous Deadwood where Wild Bill Hickok, hero of many a border brawl, died with his boots on. It says, um, These hills to the Sioux were holy ground, <clears throat> which the government had promised to retain for them inviolate. Uh, for one summer, General Sheridan was able to hold back the greedy gold seekers, but in the following spring, they broke through. Under Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse, the Sioux struck back. Colonel 
George A. Custer of the 7th Cavalry, a, dis Cavalry, a distinguished veteran of the Civil War who had been fighting Indians off and on for the last nine years, had come to like and respect them. If I were an Indian, he wrote in an article about an earlier battle with the Sioux, I would certainly prefer to cast my lot. To the free open plains rather than submit to the confined limits of a, of a reservation, there to be the recipient of the blessed benefits of civilization with its vices thrown in. In June of 1876, he led a column west from Bismarck to disperse the Sioux and Northern Cheyenne who had, who had left from their Black Hills Reservation. Custer found them in camp by the Little Bighorn River in Montana. Rashly, the officer and tactical command, Brigadier General Alfred Terry, divided the regiment into three columns, one of which Custer's was surrounded by 2,500 2, braves under Crazy Horse. Custer and his entire command of 265 officers and men were killed. <clears throat> Colonel Nelson A. Miles in, journey, in January 1877 caught up with it and defeated Crazy Horse, whose enemies gave him the compliments of calling him one of the bravest of the brave and one of the subtlest and most capable of captains. Right, so they even, they even called the Garrets their enemies brave because they were brave, man. They're the war tribe. They're a war tribe. All right. So now I'm going to go <clears throat> to here. This is called the American Indian Past and Present by Roger L. Nichols. Okay. I'm going to go to page 65. And it says. Another colonial writer declares this contagious disease was so noisome and terrible to these naked Indians that they in many places left their dead unburied as appeared by the multitude of the bones up and down the countries where there had been the greatest numbers of them. <clears throat> William Bradford asserts that in this year the Indians near the Connecticut River fell sick of the smallpox and died most miserably for a sore disease cannot befall them. They fear it worse than the plague. For usually they that have this disease have them in abundance. They die like rotten sheep. <clears throat> but by the marvelous goodness and providence of God, not one of the English was so much as sick or in the last measure tainted with this disease. That's the damn devils, man. <clears throat> it says, page 67. It says, the southern provinces were the next to bear the brunt of smallpox attacks. An outbreak began in Jamestown, Virginia in, 18, in 1960. 19, so lucky, 1696 and gradually spread into the Carolinas where it brought many fatalities to the whites and even more to the Indians. One tribe, probably the Pamlico Indians, was almost completely destroyed. A correspondent from South Carolina reported in 1699 that smallpox was <clears throat> said to have swiped away a whole neighboring Indian nation, all to five or six which ran away and left their dead unburied. lying upon the ground for the vultures to devour. The extermination of this tribe was described in 1706 by John Archdale, whose account subsequently was copied by John Oldmixon and many other 18th century writers. The, inf the infection probably spread as far west as the lower Mississippi Valley for the tribes here were attacked at this time. <coughs> All right. um, page 69. <clears throat> it says, neighboring towns such as Medfield and Cambridge reported additional cases and a correspondent from Katham noted that the disease was among the Indians of whom he said not so much as, as, as one has yet escaped. The infection continued to rage among the Indians in Canada throughout the winter, inflicting several casualties. One tribe, the Sonantonians, lost half their number. No statistics are available as to the number of cases or deaths in the various tribes but the Indian susceptibility to the infection, coupled with its widespread distribution, must have produced some grim results. The neighboring Cherokee Indians to whom the disease was carried were devastated, losing 50% of their numbers. Now, the reason I read all that, because it's prophecy. And I'm going to go into the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28, because they know <clears throat> um, fucking Aborigine tribes were devastated like that of the uh, North American Indians. I'm talking about the Abri Aborigines of Australia or New Zealand. All right, to hell with them, they're not Israelites. All right, this is uh, Deuteronomy 28, 